Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Very true. When you start thinking that you're kind of the cat's meow and you've got the world all figured out, boy, God has a way of humbling you in a hurry. Live your life with purpose. Change someone's life for the better and leave a lasting impact on those around you. Welcome to Finish Strong, the podcast designed to help you discover your unique purpose and develop a plan to leave a powerful legacy. In this episode, Dan, Brian, and Terry discuss living a life of humility. One of the most hilarious movies of all time is Anchorman. <laughs> Ron Burgundy is played by Will Ferrell, and he's a, an anchor, and he's at a party, and they're welcoming a new woman who's going to be a reporter at the station, and he goes up to her, and he says, hi there, do you know who I am? And she says, no. And he's kind of offended, and he says, well, t- I'm kind of a big deal. And I always thought that was a funny line, having worked in television for many, many years. My name's Dan Wheeler, and I'm with Brian Rowland and Terry Steen. And Brian, we've all worked with people like that in the news or in uh, television programming, haven't we? We sure have. And as you well know, uh, we both started at the same TV station years ago. And there was an anchor person there that thought he was Ted Knight. Uh, as soon as he'd come on, man, his voice would get deep and really just uh, giving everything he could for the for the camera. And, and then off camera, he was a different person until the phone rang in the newsroom. And then he'd go right back into his Ted Knight routine, which was, uh, it's just funny to see how these guys work. Like you said, in the front of the mirror, they're one thing. And then when they're with you, they're another. We've entitled this episode of Finish Strong, We Take Great pride in our humility. Terry, that's a line that you've used often in the past. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's just the oxymoron of it is just kind of funny. And I might add, if you look around your desk, hopefully you will see the plaque that I was in a store one day and I ran across the plaque that said, I'm kind of a big deal. And I could not leave that store without buying that for Dan <laughs> because he uses that all the time, and deep down, I think he may really believe it, Brian. <laughs> I've really enjoyed that, Terry. It's one of the most meaningful I've seen him go through yeah. his phone and saying, I met this person, and I met this person, and I met this. <laughs> well, you know, I have that plaque right on the end of my desk, and everyone that comes into my office, so I point to it just so they get the message. <laughs> That's good. But, you know, That's as good. we uh, yeah. grow older, I think um, some of our pride starts to fade as we realize yeah. who we are and who God is. Mm-hmm. And the example that Jesus gave us, when we read in Luke chapter 2 about the birth of Jesus, it was not what the, the uh, Jewish people of the time expected. They were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for a king. And he was a king but he didn't come into the world the way they expected him to. And I find that that's true. God never does things quite the way we expect him to. And in chapter 2, verse 4 of Luke, reading in the New International Version, it says, So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, The time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Terry, there was no room for the king of the universe in a hotel or an inn. He was born in a manger. He was. There were animals all around. There was straw. You can imagine the smell. Not to mention it was in Bethlehem. Bethlehem was just a little podunk town that you would never think a king would be born. You'd think it was Jerusalem. Almost like a place in Iowa, right, Brian? (laughs) Hey, 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 watch it now. Terry, I meant to say Ohio. Where oh, Brian was. Oh, that's <laughs> better. Just because our state tree is a telephone pole, I don't think <laughs> that's a good one. But Brian, really, it's not the way any of us would expect Christ to come into the world. I feel like God always does things differently than man expects. Well, that's the truth, you know, and he uses people you would never expect them to use. At least they'll be gathered the most. You know, I mean, he usually puts them in a place that's going to attract people that you would say, well, wait a minute, what's he attracting them for? But God loves everyone, and he's going to use whoever he needs to use to gather them in. And that's what I love about this story, too. I mean, he, he brought him in in such humble beginnings 
and yet he's gonna, he was going to have the greatest kingdom. But the people couldn't understand it. The disciples couldn't understand it at first. But then they got it. When, once he arose from the dead and ascended to heaven, he told them he's returning. They understood the kingdom then. Well, Terry, he gave the disciples an example of humility so clearly. Oh, man, he did. And, you know, being born the way he was just kind of laid the groundwork and it never changed throughout his ministry. You know, in John 13, there's no better example than when he washed the disciples feet. Mm -hmm. You know, there was the, the irony of that. The disciples were so uncomfortable because he took his to his outer robe off and he got a towel and and they knew at this point. He was the Messiah. God had revealed to them he was the Messiah, but yet here he was doing a job. You know, we can't relate to it quite as well as uh, these could back then because they always needed their feet washed. They wore sandals. They were always walking. And it was usually the lowest servant that got the job of washing the feet. So they had a Messiah washing the feet and it was the irony of that was such a neat example. And Jesus was always the same. No matter who came to him, he, he approached them with love. And yet certain people saw who he was like the centurion. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, the centurion. It was in Matthew, the eighth chapter there. And he had a servant that was paralyzed. And so he came to Jesus one, he, wanting Jesus to heal his servant and Jesus asked if he wanted him to come, and he said, no, 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 you don't have to come. I understand your authority. And even though this centurion was a powerful man, he was, he was leading an army, he humbled himself, did not even want Jesus to come back to his home. And he had reason to be proud from the standpoint of society, but he understood who he was talking to. And to me, that's the neat thing. If we could remember that, if we could remember who we're talking to, then we'd understand true humility, the king of the universe. How could we not be humble? Yeah, we're going to stay with us because I'm going to talk about some of the legendary examples of humility I worked with as a host on national television for many years and how they impressed me. We're going to really take a deep dive into some scripture, some examples of humility and how God honors the humble. We're going to talk about godly examples in our own lives and then give you some great takeaways about growing stronger with humility. But Brian, you know, we, we talk about the powerful centurion Mm -hmm. And yet Jesus was impressed with the widow. That's the truth. You know, over in Mark 12, 41 through 44, it tells the story. And it's, it's just amazing when you, when you, you see how he turned us and how, how he wanted, what, what he wanted the disciples to see. It says, Jesus sat down opposite the place where offerings were being put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Now, this is what I think is great, because he called his disciples over to him, and he said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. What I love about that is the lesson we learn. She gave everything, totally depending on him to provide. And she did that all the time. It wasn't just that, that, one, that one event. And he wanted his disciples to see that you could put everything back in because I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to watch over you. I'm providing for you. You are my child. And she knew that. The rich people were thrown in just, okay, I'm going to please people. I'm, I'm making a big thing. People can see what I'm doing. Here's the money I'm giving. But yet she gave all that she had, and the Lord blessed her and took care of her. In my role as a host on QVC for 29 years, I was fortunate enough to be the sports guy. So I interviewed a different Hall of Fame athlete every week. I worked with the musicians as I hosted a lot of the music shows and worked with various entertainers of all type. And some of the legendary examples of humility that I met uh, were, first of all, Charlton Heston. The guy is one of the greatest actors of all time. He came in very humbly, was very kind to everyone. He was sell, selling a, um, the Bible on DVD, and so he was going to recite the 23rd Psalm, and he's got that great voice. And I watched him practice the 23rd Psalm, which is only, I think, six verses long, 
but he practiced it, I counted, 12 times walking. Here's the great Charlton Heston, but he wanted to make sure he did his very best. Bob Hope came in one time, and he and his wife, Dolores, and was just so kind and just uh, chatting it up with me before the show. I really enjoyed being in his presence. There was a really a calm to him. I worked with Cal Ripken Jr. many times, and he was always very respectful to everyone and was excited near the end of his career when he was going to uh, form his Cal Ripken uh, Baseball Academy. Iron Man. The Iron Man. I yeah. mean, he, he put that record so far out of sight for uh, consecutive games played. He was always there, yeah. dependable. George Foreman. My buddy, you know, he, he reclaimed the heavyweight championship of the world at the age of 45, knocking out a man less than half his age. Michael Moore was 22 at the time. Very kind. He's a preacher and uh, very dedicated to uh, getting the word of God out. And yet he has a church. And it's funny, the name of the town it's in is Humble, Texas, and really <laughs> lives up to that name. Tim Conway was the final one I'll cite. He was just such a nice guy, came in with the few clothes hangers over his shoulder, didn't have an entourage. And I noticed he was just sitting alone in a green room. So I went and hung out with him for an hour. I thought, man, what an opportunity. Just the nicest guy. So, you know, sometimes the people who were on their way up building their career were tough to work with. They had a Mm -hmm. lot of pride at big egos. But the people who had nothing to prove, who really knew who they were, were some of the greatest and yet some of the most humble guys. That's another great example for all of us. Yeah, that's neat. And I think from a business standpoint, it's something that CEOs and managers many times lose sight of, that they invest their time only on that upper level. And you know the character and the humility of a business person when they know the janitor's name (laughs) and they treat him the same way they treat the vice presidents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, you know, I used to talk about my late wife, Beth, that way. She would... uh, be the same to everybody. And in the hospital, she was just as kind to the people who cleaned the rooms as she was to the nurses, as she was to the doctors, and ultimately the administrators of the hospital. Mm -hmm. Brian, let's uh, take a look at some of our favorite verses that deal with humility. You've got a great one found in 1 Peter. 1 Peter 5.5, the the, uh, NIV version, it says, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves in humility toward one another, because... God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. You know, and I think of that, I think of people, I think we all know people that are very proud. They've, uh, they, they start to tend to believe that it's them that's taken, that's, that's taking care of things and it's not God. And eventually they all seem to lose everything they've once had and have to start again. But God, he opposes the proud, but he shows so much favor to the humble as we saw with the widow's might. So Dan, that's one of my favorites. Yeah. Terry, how about you? Solomon was the wisest man in the world, and he wrote some incredible proverbs, and many of those talk about humility. So you know Solomon had to kind of figure it out, I think. And I come to Proverbs 22, 4, says, Humility and the fear of the Lord bring wealth and honor and life. So we come back to the fear of the Lord, which is being in awe of God and understanding who he is. And that helps us live a humble life. And there's a reward for living a humble life. It tells us that we will have some type of wealth and honor and a life that's worth living by being humble. Boy, so true. Great words in Proverbs. And I'm going to stay in that same book, Proverbs 16, 18. This is a verse that I think many people who don't know the Bible still know this verse because it says, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And many people uh, know pride comes before a fall. Very true. When you start thinking that you're kind of the cat's meow and you've got the world all figured out, boy, God has yeah. a way of humbling you in a hurry. That's yeah, right. That's the truth. And you know that it's, it's, it's funny because I just mentioned about we've all know people that have fallen, that have taken great pride and did things for themselves. But over in uh, Proverbs 11, too, sticking with that, it says when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. And so we see that in everyday life. With humility comes wisdom, but with pride 
It comes disgrace. It's going to come back and get you eventually. And how many people that are, have all this pride are surrounded with real friends? It's the yes me people that are around them. Or yes or yes or you're right. But it's the ones with humility that people come to for wisdom. So true, Brian. Terry, you've got a verse that I think applies to us individually and also to us as a nation, as the United States of America. Yeah, it's one of the <laughs> most well-known verses. And with the way and the condition of our country right now, there is no verse that should mean more to us as Christians than this one, which is Second Chronicles seven fourteen. And uh, I just want to read it because it's a powerful verse. It says, if, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and heal their land. And our country needs so much healing. It needs so much forgiveness. And this talks about that humility that's needed. We have to humble ourselves, and it can only start with us. We think about our country. We think about the big picture, but nothing will change until each of us begin to humble ourselves and say this kind of prayer to see God turn our nation. Mm. Mm -hmm. Boy, it's so true, and what a timely verse. You've yeah. probably been hearing that verse quite a bit lately, but it really does say so much for where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. James 4.10, the New International Version. This says it pretty succinctly. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. I think it's interesting that it doesn't just say humble yourselves. It says humble yourselves before the Lord. Going before the Lord with that spirit of humility and saying, God, I know who you are. You are the creator of the universe. You made me, and yet you care about me. I'm really not worthy that you should have gone to the cross to die for me, but you did. And then it says, when you do that, he will lift you up. Mm-hmm. And it's so true. I think we've all experienced that mm -hmm. in our own lives. Yeah. Brian, uh, how about Micah? Did Micah have anything to say about humility? You know, what I think is great is that he's showing us what the Lord wants us to do. It says in Micah 6, 8, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. But how do we do that? Well, Philippians 2, 3, and 7 puts it right there for us. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus, which is what he told us. Is, you know, <laughs> that's what he wants us to do. Who, being in very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant that we talked about earlier and being made in human likeness. There's, there's our, our walking papers right there. It's telling us our go orders. That's what we're supposed to do right there. Right. So you guys know the three of us, Brian, Terry, and myself. We also have a producer. His name is John Matarazzo. He does a great job. He's been kind of guiding us through this podcast experience. And John, I want to think, uh, I want you to think about this. I'm going to give you a little time. Well, we're going to talk about some of the godly examples we've seen of humility. And I know you've worked in Christian TV for a long time. So maybe think about someone that maybe had an impression on you. But um, Terry, I know you work with a lot of pastors and you've probably seen a wide range of <laughs> pride and humility, not that we're yeah. supposed to judge anyone, but what or who stands out to you? Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I, I, I've consulted and worked with them and been on staff with them for probably 30 to 40 years now. And there's all kinds and they're all human. We all deal with pride. We all deal with humility. And so whether they say it or not, you can just see some of the levels or echelons based on how big a church they have or how small a church they have and who they kind of don't spend time with or who they want to hang around. And so you just observe all that in different meetings. But I've run across some pastors who have reason 
to be prideful because they have a church of two, three, four thousand. I think of one pastor in particular, his name's Carl Stevens. He lives in Orlando and he has built over the years an incredible church, an incredible Christian school. And yet, anytime I run into him at a meeting or a conference, he'll come up and introduce himself to me as if I don't know who he is, instead of like, of course you know who I am. And that's always, that always grabbed me, the humility of that, that he wasn't assuming that everybody thought of him as some great big pastor. You know, it was, I, I like that. Mm-hmm. He never says to you, I'm kind of a big deal. He didn't say that. Yeah. Oh, have you said that to him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Terry, I know you had a great mentor and role model. I mean, Brian, mm-hmm. you had a great uh, mentor before you came to Chicago and we worked at a Christian TV station. You worked for a great man. I guy. did. His name was Rex Humbard. And I, I told you before, Dan, he was just a, a great person to look up to. He was the one person that I could say that I worked with in the Christian field who walked his talk always walked his talk and it was he was just he would open the doors he had the flu one time and i i stopped by the house because my friend of mine uh was uh, his parents were missionaries and wanted to meet him and i said hey rex i said i got somebody that wants to meet you his buddy of mine from school and that and he said oh man brian he goes do, do you right now and i said yes if you could and he goes he said i don't want to get you guys to catch the flu and that i said just five minutes he took him in there and he sat with him for 15 minutes and just spoke with him and, and just became genuine. And But that's how Rex was. He always preached salvation, nothing else. He goes, I'm not a theologian. I preach salvation. If you hear any of his sermons, that's what it's all about. He walked his talk. And of course, you and I worked for a man named Owen Carr, who founded mm-hmm. Channel 38 uh, Christian Television in Chicago. I'll never forget one day we were short on our production staff and we had a production following Owen's show, and he was taking off his mic and getting ready to leave, and he heard us say, well, what are we going to do, guys? We don't have a floor director. And he says, hey, guys, what does a floor director do? And we said, oh, he's the guy that holds up your time cues and makes sure you're on the right camera. And he goes, well, I could do that right. We said, oh, Owen, we know you're busy. He goes, no, I, I don't have anything for like an hour and a half. He takes off his suit coat, rolls up a sleeve, puts the headset on, and to see Owen, the president of the station, holding up time cues and Going for, you know, but that was the kind of man he, he was. You could always tell because he always had creases in the knees of his suit. He was on his knees in the morning. Well, we don't have a lot of time, but John, uh, who comes to your mind so, as an example um, of humility? So actually, I have a verse that I want to share kind of leading into that real quick. My life verse it deals with humility, and it's Isaiah 66, verse 1 and 2. And that second part says, um, but God says to Isaiah, but on this one, I will look on him who is humble and in contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word. And so whenever God speaks, I want to be somebody that is so concerned about what God said that I'm obedient to it and I'm humble. So no matter what situation of life that I'm in, I'm submitted to his will. A couple years ago, I had the opportunity to work with a man named Doug Stringer on my TV show. I actually got to do a podcast episode with him. Something that he said that has always stuck with me since then is he says, I've got no special qualifications. I'm just available and obedient for whatever God has for Mm -hmm. me. And that has opened up so many doors for him. And that's been a challenge for me continually. Well, that's great, John. I'm a little disappointed you didn't mention any of the three of us, but (laughs) that's okay. Uh, (laughs) Well, guys, we don't have a lot of time. I guess we've got about 30 seconds each to kind of give our takeaways, our personal takeaways on how we can grow stronger with humility. Terry, I'll start with you if you're ready. Yeah, yeah. I think it's just like everything. We follow Christ's example. You know, he lived a life of humility. And when we do, there's rewards for us. Just like we've talked in the scripture, there's answered prayers and honor and life, and he promotes us. So if we'll fight that human nature of pride, God will reward us and take care of everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about you, Brian? Well, I'll tell you, there's there's a gentleman that I I grew up in church with, one of my heroes. His name was Dr. Bruce Motter. Everybody that knew him knew he was just how he was, humble, a humble man. But the things he would teach you, and he was a good mentor. Like when I was getting married, he said, I said, what's the secret to a, a successful marriage? And he said, who can outgive each other? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, you say, I love you. She says, I love you more. You keep doing this to see who can outgive each other. And boy, that has been just a pattern for success. And it was things like that that just made him so special to everyone. Oh, that's great. I know as I grow older, I realize more and more that I have really nothing to be proud of apart from God. I've, everything I've accomplished was by the grace and mercy of him. 
God loves the humble, but he opposes the proud. And I want to always remember that, you know, your, I think your accomplishments fade. We've all had that box of trophies we won when we were younger that just sat around and collected dust. So maybe it's time that you got rid of that box of trophies and you replaced them with new accomplishments uh, for the Lord and always having that humble uh, spirit and that humble attitude toward everyone you meet. Amen. Well, John Matarazzo, could you quickly tell everyone where they can hear our podcast as we conclude? Yes. Uh, make sure that you subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening. If you're in iTunes, definitely make sure that you rate and review uh, the Finish Strong podcast. Give us five stars and write a review, and that helps more people discover how they, too, can finish their race strong. Well, thanks, guys, and thank you for listening to another episode of Finish Strong. We'll look forward to the next one. Remember, stay strong, but stay humble. God bless. Thank you for listening to Finish Strong. For more information about Finish Strong and Fearless Faith, check out their website, ffaith.org. Make sure that you rate and review this podcast to help more people accomplish their God-given purpose so that together we can finish strong.